So I would like to welcome um, Emily Richardson to the stage. Emily is the Care Information Developer at the MND Association covering England, Wales and Northern Ireland. Thank you, and what a privilege it is to be here today to talk to you all about our information provision. So one size does not fit all. I think we all probably know and agree that this is the case for um, caring for a condition like motor neurone disease, ALS, but it's also true for information as well. So I'm here today to talk about us expanding our range of information formats to support families affected by MND. Um, and we have over 70 publications, um, so we, we think we have the largest information on um, collection of MND, ALS specific information in the UK, but we also think the world as well. Uh, but we're still not reaching all of those families affected by MND, and this is a gap that we've been trying to fill. So just to give you a bit of background of the information formats we already provide, um, historically, Print has been our primary focus, and we provide printed guides, information sheets, forms and tools for adults, and guides for children affected by the disease. And many of these are also available to download from our website. Our website itself is also a source of information for many people. We also have um, some web apps. We've got our first audio version of our introduction to MND that we developed earlier this year. Uh, we've also got a suite of animations, vlogs, and a range of our key decision-making information resources are translated into a number of languages and Braille. So I'd say that we're off to a pretty good start, but there is still more that we could be doing to reach those harder-to-reach communities. So I'm a member of the education and information team at the association, and our purpose is to ensure people living with MND, their families and carers, can access the information about the condition that they need, when they need it, in the format they need it, and that they can apply this information. And by apply information, we, we mean use it to make informed decisions, open difficult conversations with health and social care professionals and, the, and uh, their family and friends, and know what support they're um, entitled to and go about accessing this. And this general concept is called health literacy, a person's ability to access, understand, and apply information about a health condition. Now, literacy in the UK is actually quite poor. In England, 42% of adults cannot understand the information that's given to them, and this figure rises to 61% when numeracy is involved. In Wales, 12% of the adult English-speaking population perform, uh, have a reading age of between five and seven years old, and this figure rises to 26% uh, in the Welsh-speaking community. And in Northern Ireland, 18% of the adult working age population perform at the lowest literacy levels. But the beauty of health literacy is that it can be improved. It's not static. And we can improve that by making our information about health conditions easier to access, understand, and apply. And we can do this by expanding the range of formats we provide that information in. So how can this help? Well, any one person could have a whole plethora of information needs and preferences. So if we take a person with MND, for example, uh, they may, as I've just mentioned, have low literacy levels, or English might not be their first language. They may simply prefer to access audiovisual information rather than written. They could have a print disability, which includes um, dyslexia, but also if MND is affecting their hands and making it difficult to hold a printed resource, that's classed as a print disability. Um, with MND as well, perhaps cognitive change or frontotemporal dementia, FTD, could be having an effect on processing language. They may have a print or digital preference. I, I personally prefer to read from paper rather than a screen. Um, or sight or hearing impairment could be creating a barrier to information. And MND just may be so tiring that reading um, a big information resource isn't possible. 
And when we widen these considerations to the whole family, we have additional factors too, such as age-appropriate information if there are children and young people involved, um, time to read if we're considering a main unpaid carer, and different members of the family and friends might be at different levels of acceptance or coming to terms with the diagnosis, so may need different levels of detail. So why else should we expand our formats? Well, as well as health literacy and information needs, the UK is going digital. So over the last six years, uh, where the blue lines indicate figures from 2011 and the orange 2017, uh, there's been a rise in internet use in the UK. But the really key age groups here are the 65 to 74 year olds and the 75 plus. Um, the gap really is beginning to close in these age groups. As well as this, um, research found last year that 53% of three to four year olds, 79% of five to seven year olds, 94% of eight to 11 year olds, and 99% of 12 to 15 year olds in the UK go online. Um, now we have two information resources for children and young people uh, at the MND Association. We have a printed workbook, which is for children aged four to 10, uh, which is designed to be interactive, so worked through with a trusted adult, and a guide for 11 to 18 year olds, which is available in print, PDF, and as a web app. But if we consider these figures, I think there's clearly quite a big gap for a web-based younger children's information resource, which we are, um, developing at the moment. We also ran a small scale survey this year to assess the information needs and preferences of the people that we support and when asked how they usually access information about health and social care, um, computers and mobile devices were the most popular means of access, whereas print was only about half as popular. But I think what this graph shows is that there's still clearly a demand for the printed resource. And I will say at this moment in my presentation, we're not looking to get rid of print. We're just looking at how we can take what we've already got and push it out further to reach those people who we aren't currently reaching. And our own figures support this too. So over the last four years, where the blue lines indicate print request figures and orange are download figures, um, the demand for print has remained uh, largely the same, if not declined slightly, but um, there's been a dramatic increase in our download figures from 2015. And so what we're now starting to see is that people are accessing MND-specific information in, uh, more in a digital way. So um, some of the work we've already done also supports this. So um, this blue guide is our end of life guide, which is available in print as a standard PDF and as an interactive PDF where you can select on the contents page where in the booklet you want to be taken to. Um, and it's also available in extracted sections. And when we start looking at these extracted sections is when we start to see some really interesting figures. Um, so there are 15 sections in the guide and there are two uh, really quite sensitive ones and that's section four, what to expect as the disease progresses and section five, how will I die? Um, and together, consistently over the past four years, these, the download figure for these two sections has been double the download figure of the other 13 sections combined. And when we drill down even further into this um, and look at the download versus print figures for these two sections, for section four, the download figure was 200 times that of the print request figure. And for section five, the download figure was over 351 times that of the print request figure. But this makes sense, doesn't it? When we allow people to have that choice in how they're accessing information, we not only enable them to pick really specific information that they want to read at that moment in time, um, it's also instant when you download it, but we also remove um, another barrier, and that's having to call or email our helpline and request to order, how will I die? So we're enabling people to access this really sen sensitive information in spaces that they feel comfortable. Um, as I mentioned earlier as well, our guide for 11 to 18 year olds, um, so what is MND anyway, is available uh, as in print and as a downloadable PDF and as a web app. And since the start of 2016, the figure for the PDF downloads and web app access has been double that of the print request um, figure. 
But again, this sort of makes sense when we think back to that uh, graph I showed earlier of 99% of 12 to 15 year olds are using the internet. By creating um, the same information in a format that's more friendly for the internet and more technological devices, we're meeting children and young people where they are instead of expecting them to come to us. Um, so we also converted our first um, information resource, our introduction to MND, into audio format in January this year. And since its launch, it's been listened to 140 times, which may not sound like a huge number, but when we consider that this is our first resource designed specifically for people who um, are, have partial sight or blindness, um, who can't read Braille, and how rare a condition motor neuron disease ALS is, I think the number is quite substantial. And although this publication is designed for people um, who have a barrier to reading information, we also make it accessible to um, people who perhaps have eye strain or fatigue as well. So this may also contribute to where these figures are coming from. And we also, earlier this year in March, launched our first animation called What is Motor Neuron Disease? And since March, it's been viewed 18,000 times, which is quite astounding, really. Um, and the reason we produced this um, resource was, again, it removes the, a barrier to reading for perhaps people who have low literacy levels or English as a second language. Um, but we've also added subtitles on, as you can see there, and an audio description, so people um, with sight or hearing impairment can also engage with the information. And it's about three minutes long, um, and it's something that can be shared in a number of different settings, so perhaps in a clinic setting or uh, during a volunteer visit, but as well, the person with MND could share this with their family and friends, and it might save them having to explain the disease over and over again. And it's also a really um, easy thing that can be shared on social media as well, so we can get that um, impact out even further. So what's the impact of all this? Well, Public Health England in 2015 said that health literacy is related to health outcomes and service use, and people with limited health literacy are more likely to use emergency services, less likely to successfully manage long-term health conditions, and as a result, incur higher health care costs. So hopefully, the more people we can reach with our information, the more people, um, the lower, um, we can reduce the uh, strain on the health service and hopefully have fewer avoidable hospital admissions as well. As well as this, um, by expanding the range of information formats we provide, we become more inclusive. So we know that PDF files um, are compatible with screen, screen reading technology uh, for people with visual impairment. And, um, over half the people we support in England, Wales, and Northern Ireland use computers or tablet devices uh, as communication aids. So by creating information that's really compatible with these devices that we know people are already using, um, again, we're meeting people where they are. We can also reduce the impact of the disease on access to information. So we've been told stories in the past where a person with MND and their carer together have um, accessed our end of life guide on an eye gaze system. So by creating that possibility, we're putting the person with MND and the carer on the same level and the person with MND can be active in their information rather than passive, for example, perhaps being read to. And most importantly, if information is power, then surely a lack of information is disempowerment. And the more people we can reach with our information, the more people we can empower to um, make those informed decisions, have those difficult conversations, and access the support that they're entitled to. And I've just got a couple of quotes from people who are living with MND who have fed back on our information. So um, one lady said, I'm finding it more difficult to turn pages, so online information is really helpful. And I'm a digital tourist. As I get deeper into motor neurone disease, I'm not quite sure what I will need, and it may be that more audio will be useful. So what we're doing about all of this, um, next year, 2019, we're going to be converting a lot of our, PDF, our static PDF um, files into e-readable publications, which means that the text flows freely on the screen no matter how big you want the, the font size. So at the moment on a PDF, if you 
want your text size to be quite large, you have to zoom in on the document and then scroll across to get to the end of the sentence on the page. Uh, so e-readables are just a little bit more friendly with tablets and computers. Um, we're also exploring the possibility of chatbots which sit on the website and you can ask them a question and it will come up with an answer or direct you to further uh, support. And one of the results from our small survey that we ran earlier this year was that people really liked the animations. Um, so we're going to be developing more of these. And I think those, the 18,000 views figure also supports that decision. So what I would like you to take home from this presentation today is I would like you to consider the information needs and preferences of the whole family that you're supporting and question whether you're providing them with information they can access, understand, and apply. Allow the behavior of the people you support to influence the way you work. If you know that 99% of teenagers are using the internet, let's um, take that into account and provide information that they're gonna be more willing to access. And we all need to embrace and adapt to the changing way that people are accessing information. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Emily, for that presentation. Um, does anybody have any questions? I have Rod down here at the front. Uh, Rod, Rod Harris, Motor Neuron Disease in Victoria. Emily, thank you for that. And, and the information about literacy and numeracy is both scary and surprising. One of the things we've found with a broad range of information is that you can have all the formats in the world, but actually people want to sit down face to face and make that relevant and usable for them in their own home with someone who knows about the disease. Um, information's terrific, but unless it's applicable and relevant, it, it really just becomes another piece of rubbish on the sideboard. How does MNDA deal with the need for people to sit down and talk with people face to face so that the information that you're providing, which is excellent, and we've used for 25 years, is relevant and applicable. Um, so we have um, branches and groups all across uh, England, Wales, and Northern Ireland where people can get together, um, and they're kind of, uh, some of them are in support group formats, some of them are more social. Um, so I imagine people there can sit and talk to each other about information there as well. We also have uh, an online forum, which is a really, it's a safe online space for people with MND and carers and anyone affected by the disease, uh, where they can go and talk to each other um, virtually. And that seems to be quite a big place for people to discuss information. But also, we really encourage communication between health and social care professionals and people with MND. Um, so we also have a range of information for health and social care professionals and throughout those publications we um, say here is a piece of information for a person with MND or a carer to access for you two to share. Um, as well as that we have a little booklet that's designed to help people with MND open conversations with health and social care professionals. Um, so that's another thing that we do. Has, has that answered your question, yeah, yeah. I think. Okay, any other questions? Yeah, there's one more. Um, you quoted large numbers of people downloading things. How do you know who's downloading? Um, in truth, there isn't a way to know exactly who is downloading that information. Um, we use Google Analytics and we track unique downloads. So we know that it's not the same person within the space of five minutes, perhaps leaving the download and going back to it again. That is one thing that we do know. Um, but there's, there's no way to track exactly who is downloading those resources. But it's people who have got there from our website. So it's an indication. Right, so it could be anybody really, not it, necessarily anybody with MND or any contact with it. No, but the, the content is MND specific, but we, we have no real way of knowing exactly, pinpointing exactly who it is that's downloading. Okay, 
One more question, I think. It's less of a question and more of just um, an observation within our team that electronic access to information hasn't necessarily been a limitation. Um, each of our MND patients are provided with our personal email addresses work within work. And that allows them to, to communicate more effectively with us out of working hours as well. So if they've got something that they want to discuss, they can email middle of the night and we can access that first thing in the morning and get out and react to them quite quickly. So I think although there's a criticism towards electronic provision, actually it's been really helpful and, and really personal for, for these patients. That's really great to hear. Thank yeah, you. Thank you. Okay, I think we do need to move on now to the next speaker. So thank you very much, Emily, for your presentation. Thank you.